Hey guys, uh, I debated back and forth whether or not I should do this, but after the last two days, I feel like I need to say something. For any of you who don't know about the recent Chris Stuckman situation where he uploaded a video on Madam Web, which the title of the video says, I have to talk about this, got a lot of attention on X or Twitter, whatever it's called now exactly, if people still call it Twitter. He's gotten a lot of people upset over how he approached his views on Madam Web, basically putting all the blame on the studios and absolving the filmmakers of any wrongdoing. But we'll get to that. I don't really like to talk about other YouTubers on here because I like to try to stay out of that drama. I don't know Chris Stuckman personally. I've never talked to him one-on-one -on -one, face to face. He's liked and responded to some of my comments that I made on his old Facebook page in the past. And for all I know, he might actually be a really nice guy. And he's built a reputation for himself and he's inspired a lot of people, including myself, to pursue a YouTube channel where we talk about movies. But I guess while we're on that subject, Chris Suckman is really the reason why I started this channel in the first place. At least talking about movies anyway. I started my YouTube channel in 2009 where I just made little fan edits and whatnot. But it wasn't until the year 2012 when I was 22 years old. I was looking up reviews of Dark Knight Rises at the time, looking up what people thought about it like Richard Roper. And right next to Roper's review I saw Chris Suckman's video on Dark Knight Rises and I watched it. And then after that I started to watch more of his reviews. And as I started to watch him and listen to his opinion on Dark Knight Rises I realized that this guy's just like me. He's just a normal average guy off the street who goes into the movie theater for the fun experience, and he's not one of those higher educated movie critics like Roger Ebert or Richard Roper. No disrespect to any of those guys, because they do have their place. But to see people like Chris Stuckman, Jeremy Johns, and Schmoes know who I discovered in the following weeks or months after that, it showed me and a lot of other people that there was a community out there of the movie fandom that we also had a voice too. And after a while, I started to think that maybe I actually want to do movie reviews. And sure enough, the following year, a couple months after I came home from basic training in the military, I started reviewing movies movies, with Don John being the first one. And for the next several years, I started to watch Chris Stuckman's reviews as he talked about Marvel or any of his past favorite movies. But then he also had a lot of others that he didn't really care for either. The most notable example is uh, Dragon Ball Evolution, which he called his least favorite movie of all time. He even got to a point where he did three different videos on that movie alone. And if you watch them in chronological order as they came out over the years, it's kind of neat to see how he updated his style and how he became more comfortable with being a reviewer and he was able to think more deeply about why exactly the movie didn't work for him but what really drew me to Chris Stuckman was that he just seemed very genuine and honest and really fun to watch he seemed like a normal guy that you would hang out with every day and you could talk about all the kinds of stuff that someone like me would talk about, since I don't really have that many friends that have that similar commonality. I do have some of those now, thankfully. There was other YouTubers that I started to follow after that that have gone on to do other things, but there was still that common thing that we all liked. And to see someone from another end of the country or even another person from all the way around the world, we all had that one thing in common, a love for fiction, a love for art, media, film, television, games. It was a really good time. And to see Chris Stuckman build his channel over the last decade or so, he's been on YouTube, I think, for about 10 to 15 years. This guy has really made a positive mark on me and a lot of people. You got to give credit where it's due. His hilariosity reviews really opened my eyes to certain movies that were out there that I had no idea would have existed otherwise, particularly The Room, which was his first hilariosity review. For anyone who doesn't know, he calls it such an atrocity that it's hilarious. It was an exciting time, though, to see him talk about some of the movies that I was excited for. Even if I disagreed with him on some of his takes, I still really liked listening to him. And of course, he did his collaboration with John Flickinger, the flick pick. The collaborations that they did together, it was like a perfect yin to his yang, basically. John was a lot more out there and crazy. Chris was a lot more dry and reserved and mellow. And I won't lie, some of the Q&As that they would do every once in a while, I thought those were kind of fun. Stockman even got to guest star on the Screen Junkies podcast a few times during those movie fights. Does anybody remember those? I really miss when Screen Junkies was like that. They're called fandom entertainment now, but still. That was kind of neat to see him actually put a stake in the ground and say that the first Amazing Spider-Man was not a good movie. He actually called it a horrible movie at the time. I don't know if I would go that far exactly, but for him to actually take a stand at a time where everybody was heaping praise on those two movies, I said, thank you. Thank you. You're not blinded by the bandwagon either. Thank God. But he even got to do his own little sideshow on Screen Junkies where he invited some people on like Dan Merle, Jeremy Johns, and even his own wife, Sam, where he talked about their favorites and least favorite of a certain actor or director. Again, to reiterate, it was a really fun time to watch him and see how someone like me could actually have a chance to 
get into that kind of realm of movie discussion. This is something that I don't really have with people that I know from my day-to-day -day life. Not that that doesn't have its place or anything, but if I had that same opportunity to guest star on a show where I could talk about movies that I like or didn't really like with other people who had the same type of love for cinema like I do, it was very validating to say the least. There's other YouTubers that inspired me, yes, but he was the catalyst for this. I say all this to be clear that I got nothing against him personally. I do have some issues though as of how he's conducted himself in the last several years because something with Chris Stuckman really changed. I'm not exactly sure what it was until I came across one of his re-uploaded videos that was not re-uploaded by him, it was another YouTuber about his Batman v Superman rewrite. Does anybody remember that scenario where he had a proposed rewrite of how he would approach the big fight between Batman and Superman? He posted it on Twitter, and to say that he got a lot of hate for it, that's an understatement. I'll put the link in the description for you in case you're curious, but to provide some context for you, I'll put a couple of clips in here for you. So as we all know, the movie came out and it didn't receive the best reception from critics and fans I think were mostly divided. Some people liked it, some people didn't. I didn't really like the movie that much at the time, but he wasn't really that thrilled about the movie either. That he decided to put up an idea that he had on how he would approach the movie in a certain way. But we all have those ideas of what a movie should do, especially when it comes to a character that we really love. So he had every right to post the idea that he had in mind. And everybody was giving him hell for it. To the point where he was getting death threats, his wife was getting death threats, and someone actually got a hold of his father and started talking crap to him. I had one guy go as far as to search Stuckman through like the white pages called various Stuckmans in the state of Ohio until he found my dad and started talking shit to my dad. To be a depraved weirdo who goes out of their way to threaten somebody's loved ones that is probably the lowest of the lowest you can get. There was also another situation where he got upset over Red Letter Media making a joke about him. I don't know what exactly was going on there. I didn't really look into it that much. It wasn't too long after that that I started to notice a change. I think it was 2017, 2018-ish. The way he came off or the way he talked to the camera, something just felt kind of off. It's almost like he lost his enthusiasm. And just to be clear, a lot of people have said that, you know, he mellowed, he matured, became more wiser, and he doesn't have time for drama. And, you know, that, that happens when people get older, you know? You don't have time for any pettiness or anything like that. Maybe that is true. I'm not saying that it's not a possibility. I think it was a spoiler video of Spider-Man Homecoming where he talked about Michelle Zendaya's character revealing that she's called MJ by other people. Another major spoiler is that Peter's classmate, played by Zendaya, at the end of the film, she's like, oh, by the way, my name's MJ. It was sort of like in Dark Knight Rises when uh, Joseph Gordon-Levitt, spoilers, if you haven't seen Dark Knight Rises, is taking the form from that lady and she's like, you should use your legal name. I like that. Robin. And I was like, oh. And they did it again with MJ and that's basically the same reaction I had. Oh. Hmm. I know I'm probably reaching with this example, but that was one of the first red flags that I noticed. Or, I don't know if it, red flag is the right way to put this, but that was a big indicator where I realized that something in him is different. And there was another thing that he said in his review of Creed II the following year in 2018. I really enjoyed this movie. I had a blast watching it. I felt something. This movie made me feel something. Uh, my cold, jaded heart was broken into by this movie and I actually had emotion. I don't know about any of you guys. I've known at least a couple people who are like that. They pride themselves on being hard asses and that they hate everybody when they're actually just a big softy underneath. I personally don't like it when people do that because to me anyway, it comes off as them thumping their chest at everybody saying, I'm better than you because I'm a cold hearted person and everybody else who's soft and kind is completely weak and pathetic. I'm not saying that's what Chris Stuckman was doing, but that was another big red flag for me. Now, of course, he still posted his hilariosity reviews or his reviews of certain movies that were pretty bad and a lot of the ones I didn't see, like the Emoji movie. <laughs> that intro alone, <laughs> that's what I call the definition of a mental breakdown. Just make sure you turn the volume down when he gets to the point of screaming. If you remember the video, you'll know what I'm talking about. I also remember another video he did where he talked about a series 
of projects like Daredevil Season 3, Bohemian Rhapsody, and maybe there was something else. I don't know exactly. It was another step that I noticed in his change in demeanor and how he felt about certain things. I know it's more or less how I felt about his opinion on Creed 2 or Spider-Man Homecoming. I mean, he did say that it wasn't an awful movie, so I'll give him that. But the way he wrote the movie off is way too safe. I know other people feel this way. I don't know what it was exactly. Just something about that really rubbed me the wrong way. I also began to notice around that time period, 2017-18, that he became a lot more vulgar than he normally was prior. In fact, in light of his Jehovah's Witness video from a few years ago, that actually does make a lot more sense in hindsight. But there was a period for a while where I found his fetish for cursing to be rather insufferable. There were times where he did kind of lose it and really unloaded. In fact, in his last video he did on DBE, he put in a disclaimer saying there's going to be more cursing than normal. And I said, hey, go for it. If you're passionate about this, let it all out, dude. Let it all out, man. Then he did a spoiler video on Glass the following year in 2019 where he said something like how we've had a lot of safe movies in 2018 and then got really mad about it or something. I... I, I don't know it. You could check it out if you'd like to because he was really mixed on the movie at the time and I'll admit that movie was kind of all over the place for me. I didn't really know how to feel about it and I haven't watched it since then but we'll get to that another time. Then his spoiler video on Avengers Endgame. At least to me he sounded really flat and lifeless. Does that make any sense to you guys? I mean he was excited yes but the way he talked about Captain America catching the hammer. Oh my god, yes. I forgot about Captain America with Thor's hammer. You see, that right there is... Um, every movie has like that one moment where you're like, F*** yes! And that was this movie's moment for me. That whole sequence was just pure fan happiness. It gave me what I needed. It made me feel fulfilled. <laughs> it made me happy. It made me excited. I'm not sensing any genuine enthusiasm here. It was around that time where I started to lose interest in his channel. I would still watch it every now and then and was still subscribed. I wasn't really as into his content like I was before. One of the big breaking points for me, though, was his videos on the rise of Skywalker and how he felt about the Star Wars prequels now in light of the sequel trilogy. This was the big one for me. And just to be clear, if he genuinely feels this way about the sequels versus the prequels, that's totally cool. A lot of people now love the prequels, considering the wide disdain that the sequel trilogy has. And if you genuinely do like them, hey, that's awesome. Awesome. I'm happy for you. But there were some things that he said and just the way he felt about the movie and didn't really consider the implications of how The Last Jedi was played out. I thought, dude, have you thought about it this way or that way? And that's going to happen with anybody who feels differently than you do. I mean, George Lucas was trashed so heavily by fans that he just sold his property and was like, okay, clearly you guys don't give a f about my vision. Bye. And I can't even blame him. Now people wish that they knew what he wanted to do with the sequel trilogy. That's got to be very weird for him. And then literally the next year after that, he posted a video on has his opinion ever changed and his opinions on the sequel trilogy have now changed apparently. When I saw Star Wars The Rise of Skywalker, you guys know that it, it severely impacted the way I viewed the sequel trilogy. I had hope after The Last Jedi and I was like, yeah, some of this movie did not work for me, but I'm still on board. Rise of Skywalker did nothing to keep me on board. And so I went home from the theater that day and I decided I'm going to rewatch the prequels. So I like that that guy got to make the prequels exactly how they are. Do I like everything about them? Absolutely not. But over the years, and especially after the sequel trilogy, my appreciation for them has increased. People's opinions change over time. I'm not saying that doesn't happen. My opinions have changed too somewhat on certain things. But again, it was the way he was presenting that opinion that I felt... He was coming off very pompous and I know what's right and everybody else who feels differently than I do is a fool or something. I don't know if I'm alone in that. Maybe I'm not, maybe I am. But even watching that, I thought, this is coming from a guy who basically trashed the prequels for a long time and is now sucking up to them. Fast forward to 2021, where a big revelation was made about Chris Stuckman, where he came out saying that he grew up a Jehovah's Witness. Not only that, but he also came out as pansexual, which was a pretty big revelation for everybody, including me. And it actually made a lot more sense in hindsight for certain things that he said in some of his videos. A uh, little personal info about myself. My father hates movies. He never watches movies. And it was always a big point of contention between us. But he loves Star Wars. So it was one of the very few things that I had in regards to film that I could connect with him on. I remember at the time watching that and I thought, hates movies. 
Where did that come from? And just hearing how he was treated by his elders in his congregation, I couldn't really help but feel sorry for the guy. Let's be honest, everybody's got a story. And you know, even with all the issues that I'm gonna get into about Chris Suckman and some of the ones that I've already expressed earlier, I do feel a lot of sympathy for him in this situation because nobody deserves to be treated that way. And as far as his sexuality being pansexual, and I guess his wife is demi-pansexual, I'm not trying to be mean or anything. I, I don't know exactly all the terms that are now coming out because I know there's a lot of different types of sexuality that are out there now. It's not just gay, lesbian, or bisexual. Not that there's anything wrong with any of those things. I am not against any of that at all. But I did see a couple people in comment sections on certain videos that were talking about the Chris Suckman, Madam Webb situation, ripping him apart over his pansexuality. All I gotta say is, what does that have to do with his stance on movies, including Madam Webb? It doesn't have anything to do with that. That should be the last thing on your guys' minds, okay? And even then, why do you care if he's pansexual? It has no effect on you guys whatsoever. Get over yourselves. He did a couple of videos after that further expanding on his life story with the Jehovah's Witness youth and all that stuff. And I found it actually really fascinating. If I remember correctly, he wants to do a movie regarding the Jehovah's Witnesses. It's, I guess, his dream movie. Which also segueing into what he really wants to do. He wants to be a filmmaker. He's already made a movie called Shelby Oaks that's crowdfunded and it's not greenlit by any big independent studio or any big mainstream studio. It's actually what he wants to do. He wants to be a filmmaker. And he said it throughout many of his videos over the years he wants to go to film school. He wants to make his own movies. He actually, I think, did go to film school at one point in the last several years. I guess at some point later this year, it's supposed to come out, Shelby Oaks. And you know what? Good for him. He wants to make movies for the rest of his life. Hey, more power to him. That's what also was a big part of why he shifted in the direction that he is in right now. There's one video that he did called Moving Forward where he says that he's not going to review bad movies anymore. He's not going to critique movies. He wants to be a YouTube channel where he does film appreciation, film celebration, because his stance is, is that a lot of these YouTubers that spend a lot of time screaming into the void, talking about how much a movie sucks and all that, don't really consider how hard it is to make a feature film. And I didn't realize this until I saw the movie Babylon, where we see the, the scene where they go through take after take after take, that Margot Robbie's character is finally getting stressed out and almost wants to throttle a guy for stopping the scene that they're shooting. Mind you, yes, that's a fictional movie or anything, but it kind of opened my eyes and made me go, oh my god. Yeah, that, that's... That's gotta be really hard. I mean, I knew it was before then, but that kind of made me a little more sympathetic to how filmmakers approach productions like that, but I'm still not gonna shy away from criticizing anything. Basically, Chris Suckman has visited film productions, he's talked with various filmmakers, and as a result, he wants to show film celebration and appreciation on his channel. I'll always champion films that I see that I think are great and that I'd like you guys to see, but I also know that it could get old when I'm just always talking about movies I like. And I understand that. I get that for some people, they might be like, oh, now he's just gonna, I wonder what he thinks of this movie. He did a video for it. I wonder if he liked it. Like, I get it. But I have to be happy as a person. I have to. And if I'm gonna be making films, then I want to support other people who are as well. And also he doesn't wanna step on anybody's toes in Hollywood in order to get into the industry. That if he says something bad about a certain movie, he's not gonna get any phone calls from a certain agent or insider or studio exec, whatever. Okay, I respect that, but at the same time, you know, if you know how hard it is, wouldn't you offer some criticism to help people improve? I mean, it's a constant improving of your craft. Even someone like me as a YouTuber, I mean, I guess if I have to call myself an artist of some kind, I do try to experiment every once in a while, and I do have a couple of video essays in mind that I'd like to put out later this year, talking about certain aspects of games and movies and whatnot. Try to show a side of my creativity that I haven't really showed in all the years that I've been doing this. So he has valid reasons for going in this direction, but then when he put out his video on Madam Web, well, well, actually rewind with me for a second. It wasn't too long after that that I decided, uh, okay, why, why am I even here? If all he's gonna do is talk about movies that he likes and not about stuff that he doesn't really like, I mean, I understand why, but what's the point of watching it anymore? Where's the fun in that? And again, he has the right to make whatever he wants. It's his channel, he's a grown man, he can do what he wants. And I managed to find other YouTubers like Zach Pope or Ren Geekness and Austin Burke who are more in line with what I started looking at from the beginning. It's not quite the same as it was when I watched Chris back in the day, but I am getting a lot more out of it than I have been from him in the last couple years. Now, oh man, I do check on his channel every once in a while just to see what he's put up. And whenever I see a thumbnail of a video that he's done, I think it's pretty clear. I know he likes the movie, so I don't really need to watch what he has to say. But then he posted the video on Madam Web and the thumbnail made me go, 
Okay, what does he have to say about this? By the end of it, I thought, what the hell did I just watch? He basically put all the blame on the studio exec saying it was all their fault and the filmmakers don't deserve any criticism. When I saw Madam Web earlier today, there wasn't a single part of me that thought, wow, this is just a terrible filmmaker. I could not help but see the myriad of evidence that has been laid at all of our feet that this is a studio that is simply retaining the rights to their characters that does not care about the quality of this experience they're giving us. And I can't help but think, who is this for? Who wins here? Is it the audience? It seems like it isn't, guys. Is it the creatives? Definitely not. Uh, no, no. Excuse the word, but I call bullshit. I call complete bullshit. Now, yes, I don't, nobody is going to argue over the fact that there has been studio interference, especially from Sony. But then again, that's been a common place ever since Hollywood started. And when are people going to stop thinking that studio interference is always bad? I don't really have time to go into all the examples right now. I mean, everybody points out the famous examples of Alien 3, Spider-Man 3, and a lot of the stuff from Sony regarding their Spider-Man side character spinoffs. I don't think it's really any surprise. But here's the thing, though. There are some times where studio executives intervene because they think that certain limitations that they put on set creators can make the product better. Because let's face it, this is their product, it's their studio, they're paying for it, so they have to make sure it's exactly the way they want it to. One example that came to my attention was from episode one of The Last of Us, the famous scene where Joel loses his daughter Sarah. Initially, the creators wanted the episode to end right there. HBO, I think correctly, <laughs> this yeah. is where you want good partners at the network, right? Like, I always feel like the best network executives are there to honestly represent the audience. That's what they could do best. They're not supposed to write things for us. They're supposed to tell us how they feel and we are supposed to have faith in their proxy ability. And in this case, our proxies there, Casey Bloys and Franny Orsi, were saying, it's not necessarily gonna make me wanna come back, right? Like the whole season, the whole story of The Last of Us is about Joel and Ellie. Well, if we only get like a little glimpse of her at the end of episode one, and we don't bring them together and we don't understand their journey. And it just ends with a kid dying and then another kid dying and then credits. People may just not want to come back. And it was important for them because they love the show. Right. And they were like, we need, we, it will hurt all of us in our hearts if they don't want to come back. And in hindsight, the feedback makes complete sense. Yeah, they were right. And what do you know? The final result was much more beneficial. There's other examples that I could talk about, like with Peter Jackson and Lord of the Rings, Joss Whedon and the first Avengers, and how the studio was very closely involved with the productions of those movies. But they don't shy away from saying, actually, if it wasn't for them, it probably wouldn't have turned out as good as it did. If you doubt me, just look up the interviews. It's public knowledge. Everybody likes to point out Sam Raimi and Spider-Man 3. Oh, it wasn't Sam Raimi's fault. Well... Not entirely. I love Sam Raimi, and I always will, but it still was his job to make the best movie possible. And to his credit, he has admitted that he dropped the ball on that one, so he's not putting all the blame on the studio. Just a, a, a movie that didn't work very well. You know, I had a lot of... I tried to make it work, but um, didn't really believe in all the characters, and so that can't be hidden from people who love Spider-Man. I should have just stuck with the characters and the relationships and progressed them to the next step, and not tried to top the bar. Mm. I think that was my mistake. And as far as the Madam Web creative team, S.J. Clarkson was primarily known for television. I don't know her personally. I can't say if she's a good director or not. She didn't really do that good of a job either. I challenge any one of you to watch that movie and show me that there's even a shred of care from anybody's part in the production of that movie. From the actors, the writers, and the director. Even with all the limitations that they had, they still had to make the best product that they could. And they clearly didn't. And I don't think the director was that well qualified for the job. As far as the writers who had writing credits in Morbius, Gods of Egypt, and The Last Witch Hunter? They're not exactly Oscar contenders, if you ask me. So for Chris Suckman to put all the blame on the studio executives and not throw some of the blame towards the creative team, I think that's kind of disingenuous, to be honest with you. But the main point I'm trying to get here is that a lot of people don't really seem to know what exactly led him to this point, Chris Suckman, and how he's so scared to criticize movies now. I think it really all started over that situation in 2016 with his Batman v Superman rewrite. I think that situation really shook him. 
he got a taste of the criticism that he had been dishing out for a long time, and he hasn't really been the same since then. Because before then, he was really enthusiastic and energetic and exciting, but then, watch his videos after that. After that situation in Batman v Superman. Three seconds of his worst of 2015, 16, 17, and tell me you don't notice a change in his demeanor. Guys, it is that time of year, my top 10 worst films of 2015. And since we're talking about some butt ugly movies, I wore a butt ugly sweater. Oh boy, it's that time again. We're talking about some horrible films, people. Some really terrible things that I sat through this year. The worst films of 2016. And to continue last year's tradition, since we're talking about some ugly movies, I wore an ugly sweater. Oh, look what time of year it is. <laughs> oh, it's the best time of year. It's the time to talk about some really horrible movies that I really didn't like. Some films that I really couldn't stand seeing. Films I went to the theater and I thought to myself, why do I do this? I haven't really enjoyed doing that video the past couple of years. And it just, I think it has something to do with the fact that there's already so much negativity on the internet and so much complaining constantly and and all this like fake screaming and anger about movies. It's like, in reality, the filmmaker has the hard job, but it just doesn't feel like me, man. It just, it doesn't feel like me when I sit there and I complain and I, and I, you know, talk about how much I hated all these movies. I think that situation deeply, deeply affected him. And to see how all of his loved ones were getting thrashed too, similar to how certain filmmakers have gotten famously parodied through memes and whatnot, like Ben Affleck looking sad in an interview and then all of a sudden it gets repeated a million times online, when at the time he was going through a divorce and the movie that he worked so hard on didn't really get the best response from critics. You know, on the one hand, I don't really blame him for being really sad, but I think that's also a testament to Chris Stuckman and how sympathetic he is to other people since he doesn't exactly have a great past story with his Jehovah's Witness upbringing. But I think there's also one part of the video where he talked about this message that he got from somebody who wanted to be a writer and because of how much backlash Chris Stuckman received, it actually made this guy reconsider whether or not he wanted to be a writer. So this person sent me an email and he said, look man, I'm a huge fan of you. And he's like, don't worry about the jokes about your, your rewrite because you know, obviously you didn't really put much effort into it, but I have to say, it's made me reconsider if I want to be a writer or not. Because I don't think I could handle someone making fun of me that much. I think I'm just going to go back to my other career. When I read that email, I realized just how damaging this has been. It's no longer funny. It's making people not follow their dreams and knowing that that's because of me, because of some stupid, meaningless four page thing I threw up on Twitter for fun that took me less than half an hour. It's painfully sad. I'm just speculating, but I think that might have been the biggest shift for him. To shift gears here, where he talked about absolving all the filmmakers of any wrongdoing that the studio is to blame for everything. He does make a point, yes, but I think it's a little naive for him to assume that this is a recent thing. This has been going on ever since the film industry started back in the early 20th century. But sometimes a studio getting involved in a production isn't always a bad thing. Say what you want about the MCU, Kevin Feige has an outline for all of his movies. Some of the ways the last two phases have gone haven't exactly been that great, but there still is some spark there. As far as the Infinity Saga, a lot of people complain that he has his hands in the pot too much and that he should have just gave the filmmakers more wiggle room. I think it goes both ways, to be honest with you. You need to have a healthy balance of both. He does have an idea of where the overall story has to go, but he does allow his filmmakers to play around in the sandbox a bit, saying, okay, look, maybe do this or this here and there, but other than that, the ball's in your court. And as far as what he said about the prequel trilogy with George Lucas in comparison to the sequels... At its core, an artist, unencumbered by a studio, made those movies. And all three of them have a story that tracks, and it is one singular vision from beginning to end. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm sorry. And, and this goes to any Star Wars prequel fan who has that same type of perspective. Liking the prequels or not, let's be real here. That wasn't exactly a good result. Somebody should have been there for George Lucas, tapping him on the shoulder saying, uh, George... 
don't do that. That's a stupid idea. And yet with the sequel trilogy, Kathleen Kennedy just let Ryan Johnson run wild with The Last Jedi. Instead of stopping him saying, uh, no, 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 this needs to line up with what J.J. Abrams has in mind. So this notion that he brought up through his Madame Web video, that if Sony had just backed off entirely, that the movie somehow would have been good? No. I, I don't think that was a guarantee. Being unshackled in your creativity doesn't mean the piece of media is going to be good. Yes, the studio executives don't always know what they're doing, but sometimes the filmmakers and creators don't always know what they're doing either. It goes both ways. Filmmaking is a collaborative effort, and having studio executives who might have a better idea, that can actually be beneficial too. I guess, ultimately, what I'm trying to get at is, what do we do about this with Chris Stuckman and his Madam Web video? I would say probably not that much. If you really want to watch other reviews of people ripping this movie apart. There's plenty of other people out there that are going to do that. As far as how I feel about Chris Stuckman after this, I'll always appreciate the fact that he inspired me to be where I'm at now on YouTube. And I'll go back occasionally and watch some of his older videos just to reminisce on those early days when I first discovered him. But uh, I'm not going to watch any more of his videos going forward. If all he's going to do is talk about movies that he likes, which is his right to do so, it's not really as fun anymore. I guarantee you that if his movie Shelby Oaks is somehow successful, I don't really see him making YouTube videos anymore. Him being a filmmaker I think is really where his head's at. His life, his decision. And I know that there's plenty of YouTubers out there that I've discovered who are going to talk about movies and talk about their opinions in the way that I would like to hear them presented. Everybody takes away something different from said YouTuber, said movie reviewer. I get something different out of Zach Pope, I get something else out of Austin Burke that I wouldn't have gotten otherwise. And the same thing for Rank Geekness or Fandom Entertainment or Dan Merle even, who I think is actually probably the best example of a movie critic right now on the YouTube realm. I'd say I'm probably 60-40 or 50-50 with him, but I think he's very measured in his response, and I think that's probably the best way to approach film criticism. I mean, if Chris Stuckman gives this idea that if you criticize a movie, you're part of the problem, you need to stop being so negative. Well, if you're talking about that space of YouTube, then yeah, those are people that are part of the problem. But there's a big difference between criticizing a product and being a jerk about it. There's a great video out there by this YouTuber who says that movie criticism doesn't have to be negative. I'll also put the link in the description for you guys if you're curious. I already have found a set of YouTubers that I go to for their opinions on movies. If you're looking for anybody else who gives you that kind of excitement over hearing a discussion about film just like Chris Stuckman or Jeremy Johns or the Schmoes No did back in the day for all of us, I would say go for those people. Those are just my own personal recommendations. Well, I guess that's all I got to say about this current situation. Eventually, it's just going to become yesterday's news. I think in a few months' time, everybody's going to forget about it. I don't really see why people are getting so upset about it because He's been pretty clear about what his intentions were, so you can't exactly get mad at him for that. I still think it's kind of disingenuous and naive on his part to say some of the things that he said in that video. I think he's a little pompous and arrogant in his videos as of late. If he does have any future success in that area, hey, good for him. So thanks guys for hearing me out. Do you have any thoughts on this situation? If you saw the video, just let me know what they are down below. And as always, see you in the next one.